Uh, let's start with myself. Uh, it's about me, very quick slide. So I'm working in RSP architecture and engineering and planners for more than six years. I was working in a Dubai office for around six years. And the last four months I'm working in Singapore office. So I'm leading the digital delivery team for a RSP and Discord office and uh, responsible for researching the new technologies and innovative design workflow with the help of latest digital tools. And the main thing is I believe that it's not only the any digital, I believe I, I, I believe that the digital tool can fundamentally alter the way we live and work. Okay, so these are the main uh, topic I'm going to discuss in the, in the today discussion. Uh, especially when it's come to the the digital in engineering, of course the BIM will come into the first picture. So let's start with design with BIM, and then we can move beyond the BIM like a cloud to solve the problems and to open the API. Uh, this is for a next level of a, a collaboration. And then the other thing is like automation, how we can efficiently save our design time with the help of uh, automation. And then finally, there are, we can, because as of now, the, the computer, they're just following our uh, instruction. It's not actually designing anything. So there are new available technology. It's actually allow the computer to design and come up with option. And then finally, this all, we are producing so much data. And it's actually opening a new digital engineering department uh, to solve the uh, the client in much better way. So let's start with the design and construction uh, with the help of BIM. So especially the engineering team, we are using the tool for uh, the longer than any other team because it's a state forward rule-based system. So we're probably using an engineering, engineering analysis tool for uh, 10, 15 years. And then recently, probably last uh, 10 years, we are using the BIM tools. It's actually added the more value into the design and construction process when it's come to the, it's actually allow the, allow us to uh, do the do the collaboration with other disciplines to save design and construction time. And then we are also using the digital tool for visualization like AR, VR, and then to save our time in the design and when it's come to the design and performance. And then this is actually, we are, it's not a, anymore the wish list. So all the digital engineering tools are now is a part of our engineering, the integrated part of our engineering design. So I, I don't think that we can live uh, without uh, any digital tools. So let's start with the uh, RSP own project, the uh, Palm Tower Dubai. So this is uh, in Dubai, it's in the main area, it's called the Palm Jumeirah. And it's a G plus 50, uh, the tower, and we have 360, pool at the top and we have this complex structure. It's uh, happening in uh, level 50. So this like one of the complex structure in uh, Dubai, we have like uh, around six meter height, cold bent glass and all the mullions are glass. And we can't imagine to build this kind of a complex uh, building on time without uh, any digital tools. So all the possible digital tools are used uh, from the design to construction and fabrication. So this is uh, this is under construction. Uh, it will open in next year. And other project I want to uh, present here is a future museum. You can see that how complex this building. Uh, this shape is uh, uh, it's actually designed by Kill Architect and engineered by Bureau of Abroad. Uh, this is uh, also in under the construction. Uh, this whole structure, there is no 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 columns, and then it's a main core building, main uh, the core, and the outside skin is uh, holding the building, and it's all designed with all the latest engineering tools. And then the other building, uh, probably in this region, everyone know that the the jewel building, and then this is also we can't imagine uh, the design and build this kind of a complex building without a uh, digital uh, engineering tools. So I want to give a more information about this future uh, museum. You can see that from the BIM model, how how complex is it is. So all the services and the outside skin and the 
the the main core and then it's all like a just before the construction it's all designed in the in a table so this is some some additional information about this building it's uh, powered by 40 uh, 4000 megawatts electricity produced through the solar energy and new station connected to the museum and this is again the platinum certification from the lead and then around 1024 uh, the the custom pieces of the facade is uh, fabricated with the help of a robot and it's installed at the site and then each panel is a different so each panel uh, you can see the structure itself it will define so each panel is a different panel and then around 2400 steel pieces uh, is uh, connecting together and this building is standing with the help of that uh, steel pieces so this is all it's uh, it's possible with the help of bim now and then this is we already know that the bim is helping and then the, from engineering design to fabrication and construction so what's beyond bim so what's uh, possible possibility in the digital engineering beyond the bim so when it's come to the beyond bim so you can see the cloud is taking part of our life in recent year when we are working from home pandemic and then we can't imagine without the cloud uh, we can able to work in a same uh, efficiency how we how we will work in a, uh, in office like a same collaboration and same way of sharing the information it's all happening the cloud so the basic question is what is for a cloud so like a 10 15 years before the main question is the cloud everyone thought the cloud to just to store the data so there is a lot of storing uh, services happened before and then later they re realized the cloud to run the program for easy access and flexibility but the, now the the trend is the cloud to solve the problem so it's not just to store, store the data or run the program it's actually helping us to solve the problem so you can see the screenshot one of the rsp project uh, where pim360 is uh, effectively utilized to identify the issue and optimize the design process and then everyone in the same page when it's come to the design and the coordination process and we can do the change analysis and the design optimization and cloud rendering so it's all like a, you were there are some uh, uh, some process in our design process is taking a lot of time because our local machine can't able to handle that load so when it's come to that kind of uh, process, we can uh, deploy the, the cloud to solve the problem in a more effective way and more faster way. So this is the, so this is about the, about the cloud. So my next slide, so we know that the cloud is allowing us to do the collaboration and then uh, still is not enough. So the cloud and then probably if you're working in the BIM environment, you know that there is a, the terms called the common data state or common data environment. It's, it's actually solving the problem, but it's not, a, it's not enough. There is a still room for improvement. So we have, when we are sharing the file, especially when you're in engineering design, we have a lot of specialist uh, team to, we need to share the information with a lot of specialist team. So we have, so each uh, department or each discipline, they will use their own, the tool. And then the problem is how to do the integration between the two tools. So if I do some, uh, prepare some information, I want to get the feedback from other people, probably I will send through the, the IFC file format. This is kind of a intermediate file to solve the, the, the today problem. So let's imagine I am designing some engineering floor plate or something. So I want to get some feedback from my facade specialist on the reaction or something. Probably I will export everything to IFC and then let the facade specialist to design the particular portion. Even though it's a very small portion, we we forced to send the whole building. So this is what happening. This is actually solving, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea. It's actually solving the today problem, but it, there is a room. So the, the actual, the, the solution for this problem is share the information, not a file. So probably in a within two to three years, probably we will see this kind of technology coming as part of the tool. So the, all the tools are connected with the open APIs. So if you want to share some floor plate to my facade consultant in a different tool, I can choose only the particular floor, floor plate and I can send it to that 
uh, the software directly. So I'm not sending through mail or anything, file or anything. I send the particular information to the other person. So this is actually let engineers share the design information with a specialist without any file format. So probably we will see the more things. So this is not only for a design stage, this will help us during the make, uh, the manufacturing, and then even the maintenance or even visualization. So what is next? So the next big thing, uh, it's not a next actually, it's actually happening in all the big offices. So the tools, it can't solve the each and every one problem because this tools, any engineering tools are produced for a bigger audience. So let's say the whole world because they can't produce the tool for each and every project or each and every region. Because the problem is each and every region, we have a different workflow and especially each and every project, it required completely different way of working. Probably what we'll do is we just adapt to that software. We will find our uh, workaround. And if there is any manual process, we just do it with the manual process. We just try to get maximum from the software. But this is opening a new door. Let uh, automate the all the remaining processes which we can't do with it. We can't do with the tool. This is there for a long time, but the problem is uh, like a five years before you need to be a programmer uh, to do this kind of automation. But the problem is not everyone can afford to do this kind of automation because it's too expensive to deploy few person in office to just to do only the automation. Because now this is possible in this the recent technology, it's called no code uh, development platform. So this is without uh, any the coding knowledge or with the basic coding knowledge, you can do your automation. So it can be any tool, you can do your automation. So tool like Dynamics, uh, sorry, the Dynamo or a Grasshopper. So you can actually do the automation in your design process. So this automation in the future, this is part of your uh, design process. So you will be playing with the standard tool and the automation tool. And then this is not only stopping uh, to only the engineering design, especially when it's come to the engineering design, it's not only the design and the, and the information in the model or something. So we probably need to uh, process a lot of office documents. And then we can do all this automation. We can apply the same automation into our office document approval process with the help of uh, Office 365 or a power automated tool. And then again, this is, you, you don't need to be the code specialist or a programmer. So as long as uh, you know some basic code or uh, you know the visual scripting tool like a, a Dynamo, you can do your the coding and you can do your automation. Okay, so uh, in a previous slide, when it's come to the design automation, what the software is doing is the software is uh, following your step so you, you just say that just to do the subtraction and the addition, the software is just to following your step and then it's giving the result. So this is, we, we can in other time is called the, the computation design. So it's just a simply performing the calculation and executing the, uh, the process based on your step. So if you give like a step properly, it's just following, but it's not doing the analysis itself. So just following the step. So in, with this help of the new technology called generative design. So finally, we can uh, let the, the computer to do the design. So what's happening actually as an engineer, we can set the parameter and we can set the rule. So this is all my rule and then let the computer to come up with options. So all the, all the possible option it will produce. So you can go and pick the best option which suit for the, the client. The thing is, uh, usually in the early stage of design, if you're making the five option or a three option, so you can go to the client with the 10, 15 option. So you are actually adding a more value to the client. And then a lot of the, the decision, we can happen in the design stage with the help of uh, the generative design. So uh, again, if you want to do all kind of uh, automation or uh, the generative design, the, the traditional 
the skill set is not enough so that is a key point here so we need to keep learn and then we need to prepare ourselves to be uh, to do able to do all kind of advanced technology so you should be familiar with the low code or no code technologies and then this is actually whatever i i showed you even though i, I say it's a feature it's not actually feature it's happening now but the actual future is different the actual future of engineering design is uh, is is actually come up with the, the data so we have a lot of data and then we are producing the data from the design stage to construction stage and handover stage and then we are not stopping it and there is opportunity to record the data during the operation and then this is opening the the, the new door so how to optimize the process with the help of this data so the data mean the resources we can learn from this data so this is opening a new door called a digital engineering so the digital engineering is art of the creating and capturing and integrating the data using the digital skill set i will give a best example so like the the 10 years before no one will the the thought about we need to write the the code for the the automobiles because automobile everyone thought is just the the mechanical item so it will just run in a battery but now in the ford there is a there is a car they launched in 2016 as a f150 has a more than 150 million lines of the code is actually integrated with that car and it's actually helping us to uh, do the autonomous uh, vehicle system and then data analytics so they are using this code to automate lot of things in the car and then it's actually helping us to do the autonomous vehicle in the future and then data data analytics it's giving a better insight to the client and manufacturer what's happening in the car after they sold the car to the the the, the client the same thing is applicable to the future of the building so we are going to see lot of autonomous building so the the building will uh, optimize itself so it will understand the different system in a building and then with the help of uh, advanced technology coming soon and then this will go and optimize the building itself uh, so this is what going to happen so one of the example is the google data center the cooling system is saving the 30 percentage more energy than any other the standard the data center so the one of the system they are using in that the technology is a ai ai prediction so with the help of ai prediction lot of sensor it will go and capture the information in the whole data center is actually the predicting the scene for next one hour so based on that the whole system the the energy uh, the cooling system is changing and it will allow us to save lot of energy Uh, okay so i will have one more example here so this is a uh, workplace analytics designed by bureau of world so what it do is there is lot of uh, the iot sensor is connected with the, the the people in the office and then you can see the it's actually it's actually simulating how the building will look like when when in operation and especially in this uh, the condition we need to follow the 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 keep distancing so this will to understand where when the people are breaking the rule and why they are breaking the rule and what what for what reason they are breaking the so they will they come up with a different strategy to make sure that everyone following the 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 keep distance to avoid spreading the 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 covid so this is like a just starting point this is just like one of the possibility when it come to the digital engineering and then the the, the possibilities Are, are, are very big when it, with the, with the help of the digital engineering and then why it's important to engineer engineering design because we are the key foundation uh, uh, for the, the from the design from the first day and then this the key foundation is the future for autonomous building uh, and with the help of the big data and iot and uh, artificial intelligence so let's uh, be prepare our, our, ourselves to face this uh, uh, the new opportunity with the digital engineering to serve the client with more possibilities thank you thank you very much for joining this session thank you very much shay for your presentation
Next, may we invite Mr. Alistair Sargent, Consulting Engineer, Association of Consulting Engineers Singapore, to share his presentation topic, The Ultimate Goal, Automation and Optimization for High Value and Sustainable Outcomes. Over to you, Alistair. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen and I think we're going to be starting again with a polling question. So if you can help me out by answering the question when it pops up on your screen. And the question is, which statement best describes your attitude towards digital transformation? Are you optimistic, pessimistic or neutral? We'll give that a few more seconds. That's good. Okay, lots of optimism out there. Very, very insightful. Thank you for helping me there. Okay, let's start out with the my presentation. I'm going to present on automation and optimization for high value and sustainable outcomes. First of all, I want to pose two questions. How will the engineer's role evolve during this time of dramatic digital disruption? And what does this mean for engineers, clients, and the built environment? I'm sure you're all aware of the relentless pace of change at the moment, and that's only been made worse by, by COVID-19 and before everyone else got started using Zoom and Teams for, for their meetings. So my presentation will be split into two halves. The first half is another question, but I promise there will be some answers here. What is digital? And then use the second half to delve into a case study to try and explain a bit more about the concepts of, of digital. So firstly, what is digital? I mean, digital, the term digital is so, so broadly all encompassing that it's almost meaningless. It implies something, it implies that you're using a computer somehow, and perhaps that something non-traditional is taking place. But to really unpack what it means in terms of uh, building engineering sense, I've broken it down into three pillars or building blocks. These are, digital tools, data, and digital process. And we'll go through each of these three now. So I'm sure we can all appreciate the benefits of using computer-based working over traditional manual methods. It's been a long time since we had to use slide rules and, and log tables for our calculations. And although we use software and computers, these aren't necessarily what I'd call digital tools. They mimic what we would do manually in that say, a user would have to sit in front of the screen, open a software, click, uh, click buttons and push data around manually. So a digital tool is one which can be used in non-direct ways to, to automate the, our interaction with them. And the tools that can then be connected together directly. So this, for a tool to be digital, it needs really needs some sort of um, way that it can be scripted, so an application programming interface or API, or perhaps a built-in scripting layer like Grasshopper for Rhino and Dynamo for Revit. Then we have digital data. So we all work with data every day, and our data is generally uh, stored electronically on our computers. It's don't deal in paper too much anymore. But even that, even that electronic data on our computers isn't necessarily digital data. So the key here to, for digital data is that it's machine readable. It's, um, it can be created, read, manipulated, and processed without actually having to open up a file and look at it. It's structured and tagged clean data. And the obvious home for that data is a database. So once you have structured, tagged, and clean data living in a database, you can start to draw insights on that data by writing qu queries. You can ask specific questions or broad questions. For example, you could ask your data set, what is the volume of C5060 concrete in block A? And you'd get an answer very quickly, almost inst instantly. You don't have to open up a drawing and calculate yourself what the volume of concrete is there. Finally, we have digital process. 
and this is about connecting digital tools together so that data can flow seamlessly between them. And for digital purposes, we need to make this digital, pro uh, digital process engineering an explicit, an explicit skill set for structural engineers and engineers in general. So instead of having a series of single steps which are executed manually one by one, we have a process that runs multiple steps in turn and carries out iterations, checks options, makes decisions, and, uh, and then gives us all the output that we deem necessary to look at. It's all about connecting the dots between the different tools and software that we use. So now that we've unpacked digital a little bit, what can it do for us? I see, and it seems like a lot of you in the audience see as well, some huge opportunities. Dig uh, digital transformation, and if we really embrace these technologies, we can really, we can get optimized, sustainable designs and produce very high value outcomes. If you can imagine a, a series of specialized modular digital tools, which are processing clean and well-structured data in a continuously flowing process connecting client needs to high value outcomes <clears throat> along the way a, a potential like a thousands or potential infinite number of options could be generated processed checked measured and appraised against design requirements constraints or design code requirements performance requirements cost and carbon metrics and the needs of the project team and other stakeholders in the project whilst the engineer we sit in mission control conducting the process and applying our intuition and insight at the key moments to tweak and adjust the design to improve it when, when necessary in, 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 in a way that only a human really can. But are there any risks involved with this as well? Is it a black box? When we talk about these digital processes, this is a, a phrase which comes up a lot and there's, there's, all, there's a lot of concern sometimes that where is the place in the engineer in all of this? Is there questions about how we could, we could check and manage and control the work that's been done in this way? There's a feeling that maybe too much has been being done too fast to ensure any kind of quality. And I think this feeling comes from the idea that, that someone digital will, will come along and build all of this without us, without our engineering knowledge or without our knowledge of how projects work and how our clients think. And if that were to happen, it would be a disaster. And I, and I think it would be. But fortunately, all the skills that you need to create these digital workflows, they can all be learned by the engineer. In fact, they, they need to be learned. <clears throat> Engineers, we must be the enablers of our own digitally transformed future. And if we don't, then we do run the risk of becoming obsolete. So the future structural engineer or engineer in general um, may look something like this. So on the left-hand side, you can see the traditional technical and operational skill sets that, that we have, structural engineering, management skills, communication skills. And on the right, we have the additional digitally enabled skill sets that we need. So process engineering, data science, software engineering, the ability to do some coding. And not all engineers need all these skills, but we need to develop teams which, have, which, can, re which can represent or have, um, yeah, have all these skills within a single team. Let's move into the second part, which is a, a case study. So this is a, a theoretical foundation design of a project, and we'll use it to try and I'll use it to try and make some of the concepts a bit more tangible in a in a in structural engineering sense, and then maybe a Singaporean sense as well. So this this hypothetical project, we have five buildings. They could be five different teams, um, one for each building working on the superstructure. They could be geographically uh, separate. They could be different countries. And, and I'll, go, I'll go through the process, the foundation process, the, di the foundation design process that uses these, these digital process, digital data, digital tools, concepts. So a simplified version of the overall process looks like this. On the left, we have our basis of design, some SI data, and on the far right, we have our, our BIM model and our drawing productions. And we, we work from, our, from the left, we work as a, in a continuous flow to, to the right. The little symbols here, these all represent data sets which live in a database. And at no point in this process is someone going to be handing over, is gonna be emailing an Excel spreadsheet or PDF markups. 
each step of the process, the engineers will be querying databases directly and wrangling data through these processes. So the key here is that the data is at the core of the process. Let's focus on the, the beginning of the process then with this superstructure design. All our different teams, they, sh they will all be using the same source of information, a single source of truth, which is the basis of design. And traditionally that may have been lived, that basis of design may have lived in a, a Word document or PDF. But in, our, in this process, we have that data, we have it structured and tagged living in a database. So each team can then draw on that data and build their analysis models, their load rundowns directly from that data. This is information such as um, the location, so like the architectural grid lines and the architectural levels or the loading criteria, the area loads, the wind loads, seismic loads, the load cases they need to consider for the superstructure design, the combination cases. So rather than each team working in isolation, they're all using the same, same data from the same source. When they go through their design process, then they need to output some foundation reactions for the foundation of design. And that sits in another data set, in another database. Here's a sample of what that data set could look like. It's a quite a simple table. We have a column for the foundation reference. So this is a unique code for each support or each foundation in, in the building or in each building. We have an X and Y coordinate so that the foundation can be geolocated. And then we have a load case along with a corresponding load. So the load case, you've got a few samples here, no, by no means comprehensive, but uh, something I'd like to highlight is then the, the, su the superimposed end load, rather than lumping it all together, we would, sep would se certainly separate it into its component parts. So finishes, partitions, facades, ceiling and surfaces. And although that makes our data set bigger by maybe a few hundred rows or a few thousand rows, that doesn't really matter anymore because we can, because our engineers in this workflow can handle that amount of data um, easily. And it, and it leaves the options open later, for instance, if we need to design king post design for a top down construction, maybe we don't want the partition loads or maybe we don't want the facade loads at that point and we can just remove them from our data set. Back to the main process and then focusing on the initial geotechnical part of this process too. So traditionally we probably would have waited until the superstructure engineers had had um, done their load rundown and, and could produce a set of foundation reactions to hand over to the geotechnical engineer. They would have then uh, designed the piles or calculated the pile tow levels based on those that specific set of loads. But that isn't very, uh, that process is quite um, unagile for change. And so uh, fortunately our geotechnical engineers have gone through their own digital transformation. They're using digital tools and create digital processes to automate the calculation of the pile tow levels. And so now it becomes a trivial matter to calculate, make a, a foundation catalog with hundreds or thousands even of, um, of, of valid foundation designs, which, which we can pick and choose from. So as soon as the borehole data and the, the SI data comes through to the geotechnical engineer, they can start to build up this catalog. They can say, right, we will we'll consider capacities from five meganewtons up to 50 meganewtons all the combinations that the Eurocode needs us to consider, we'll consider them, the compression low case, the tension low case as well. We look at a whole range of different pile diameters, all the way from 600 mil up to two meters. And we do this for each and every zone on our site. And then after a few, few hours of uh, computer churning, we have a catalog of 10,000 piles to choose from. We're at this point, we're limited only by the, the speed of our computer. Traditionally, I think, 10,000 piles would have been too many, too many piles to, to deal with for, um, for traditional workflows. They would have, been, would have been swamped in too much data, but now our team are well-versed in data management and they can filter through this data very easily. So back to our main process and then focusing on the actual sizing of the selection of the piles. We have a, a foundation, an engineer responsible for the foundation design. They, look, they have two data sets to work with, the foundation reactions and the foundation catalog. Then it's a case of, of matching the particular found pile that piles to the foundation reactions and they can start doing some testing, creating visualizations of, of utilizations and uh, frequency of, of number of piles being used and run optimization routines. So you can run a routine to say, what is the, what solution gives me the least amount of concrete volume or what solution gives me the, the, the least number of piles or the, the, the shallowest toe, 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 toe level. 
we might look at the who's in science look at these histograms and realize that the one meter diameter pile only represents two percent of the overall number of piles so we get rid of the one meter diameter pile from our catalog and rerun it and see what the impact on the on the overall volume of concrete is we could say we could start out with a catalog of 20 different pile diameters but say we only want to have five different ones what combination of five different pile diameters gives us the most efficient design and that's what it comes down to this process and being able to work with data at this scale means we can really achieve optimized and sustainable solutions moving on to the final step of this process and that is then getting that data into our bim model I've used the database symbol here to represent the BIM model because I want to highlight that the BIM model really is actually just a database. It, can, it happens to be able to present the data stored within it in a 3D way, which is fantastic. Um, but really is it, it's a database at heart and it's the I in BIM which is important. It's the information which is important, the data. So the engineer who's looking after our foundation design, um, uh, skilled up in, in, in data science and a bit of coding and data processing. They can take the information that they've, take, that they've received from different sources, so um, pile sizes and locations, add it to information that they've calculated themselves, reinforcements level, reinforcements, concrete grades, and, and the zoning information, and then push that directly into the BIM model. So rather than marking up a, a PDF and handing it over to someone to, to copy, this information can be pushed directly into BIM when it ends up on our drawings and then ready for submission and construction. So now that our process is set up, I'd like to consider a few or well, a couple of scenarios. So, so what happens if, uh, if the client is considering adding three levels of three more levels to block B? or the contractor identifies a significant program gain by changing block C, D, and E to, to steelwork. What is the impact on the foundations? With this process that we set up, this, which is where data is seamlessly transitioning through from one end to another, we can very quickly and accurately measure the, the impact of these changes. We already have our foundation catalog there. As soon as the new foundation nodes come from, from the superstructure team, it's a case of looking up and identifying the delta or the change in the concrete and the pile length or the number of piles or the, or the pile volume. So these skills, these processes, they, they allow us to be agile and accurate in response to change. So in summary, I'd like to make four points. <clears throat> Firstly, engineers, we must be the enablers of our own digitally transformed future. We need to develop the skills to be able to work with data at scale, and if we don't, then there's a chance that we may become obsolete. Secondly, is that if we place, we need to place data at the core of our processes. And once we do that, then everything else should follow, should fall into place. And if we do that, then we can really achieve optimized and sustainable solutions. And we can react in an agile and accurate way, way in response to change. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to all right, I think that will be all for today's sessions. So if you have further questions or want to discuss any of it in more detail, please do not hesitate to reach out to the organizer. We hope you have enjoyed the session brought to you by the Association of Consulting Engineers Singapore. And the next webinar session is happening on the 15th of October at 10 a.m. Hear from our guest speakers, Di Yong and Balaji of Singapore Contractors Association. Their topic will be the productivity and innovation in constructions. At the same time, you may spend some time visiting the exhibition hall where all the 100 virtual booths are on exhibit. Thank you once again for joining us today and stay safe.